Okay, I'm aware I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I'm going to make it as quick and as snappy as possible. So what are we doing? Eh? This is a, a talk about work I'm doing with a colleague, Hu King Lee, who is somewhere in the audience, right at the back, just waving. Um, and what we're doing is looking at how you can profile learning programs. Yeah. So this is done in the context of looking at Erlang on multi-core systems, and in particular, a European project called Release. Um, I'll say a tiny bit about that, then I'll talk about Percept, which is the tool that we're building on, which is a standing on shoulders of giants project. We're not starting from scratch, we're building on something that, that's very good, that's already there. Take you through what we've added, and then talk through a, a short case study about parallelizing a tool called Wrangler, which is something that we and I were involved in writing. <coughs> okay. So Erlang Multicore, I'm sure you all know, but just to, to, um, to remind you, um, if you have multiple cores, then you'll get multiple schedulers. So you're able to, to run things in parallel on the multi-core machine, like one here, with the poultry two cores, or other machines which have a substantially higher numbers. So that's something that's built into Erlang, um, and we're not, in a way, we're not expected to look inside the box look at the details of what's going on there, but we do need to understand how our programs run on multi-core in order to parallelize them effectively. So we need tools that will help us do that. We're also in a situation, and this is, if you like, a, 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 an advertisement for this European project called Release. The idea of that is that what we want to do is build a scalable version of Erlang. Um, when I say version, I mean effectively a, a library for Erlang that will allow us to use distribution in a way that's scalable. And that, well, that, the, the point we've got to, we're a year into this project, a European project involving Harriet Watt, Uppsala, uh, Technical University of Athens, Ericsson, and a number of other companies. Um, what we've got to, the point we've got to is, is the notion of scalable groups, so that in, instead of distribution being, being universal, we're allowed to, to scale that, and placing, placing things on within a group implicitly. So that's that's where we're at, but we expect to have a release of release, the first tools for release um, early next year. But what we're particularly interested in is how to build tools to, uh, to enable us to use these sorts of um, systems effectively. Um, and that's something that I think <coughs> we've been doing for about 10 years, looking at tools to, to help people build functional programs, to, to uh, refactor those, what we're looking at here is, is profiling. So, um, in a way, the input you might have to doing a refactoring to make your, your program work more effective. So, the sort of tools that you get out of the box is fantastic. I can't say strongly enough how, how good the Erlang tracing facility is. The fact that you get that without recompiling. Uh, I mean, I, I also do some work in the Haskell space. And there, you can finish up with multiple versions of programs because you want to do different things with them. In Erlang, you just get tracing for free. It's great. Um, so you, you might well use Erlang tracing, and lots of, there are lots of tools out there which effectively are a, a skin on top of, of the built-in tracing facility. If you're on a Linux system or, or, or a Mac, uh, you can use HTOP, which shows you, in a multi-core way, um, uh, information about activity per core, and so on. Erlang now has D-Trace support, that's in the latest release, um, and we, as part of release we've been doing some work on extending that, and there's also the Percept tool, and that's what we're focusing on here. So what does Percept do? It's an, it's an acronym for Percept being an Erlang concurrency profiling tool in the Erlang distribution. It's mainly written by Björn A. Gil Dahlberg, who's in the OTP team. Um, it uses built-in facilities, and it's an offline tool. You run the computation, and then you can play it back and explore what happened. Um, so that's the key. That's the key message. And I, I realise, I'm sorry, that my some of my slides have things close to the bottom. But anyway, crucial message there is offline tool allows you to replay a computation. And the sort of things you can get is a histogram of the number of processes that are active against time. You can drill down and find out information about the individual processes. Um, you can view the runability of an individual process, and get you know, various other things. So, nice tool, but we felt that there were ways we could make it even nicer. Um, so, 
uh, or here's a picture, this is a, a view, we've seen lots of pictures of green on them during this talk. Um, this is showing you the number of processes that are active. In Percept um, view, you can see what processes that are active. That doesn't distinguish you between them being running and them being runnable. Um, so you don't get a sense of that. Um, that's one of the things that we've added. But there you can see, this is something where they, at the maximum point there are 100 and something, 160 processes that are, could be running at any one time, at that, at that peak there. So that's the sort of thing you see with percent. Um, what have we added in, um, <coughs> in going to, to percent two? First of all, it, it talks about concurrency, but the, the multi-core aspect of that is invisible. Um, so what we've added is information about run, crew, run queue migration, because um, I mean, you can get migration because of, of, of um, smoothing out queue sizes, but also if a processor is, um, if, a, if a scheduler is, is, um, has no work, it will steal work from other schedulers. So th processes can migrate, and it's, it's surprising how much migration goes on. Um, so we can, you can see that a processor might have moved 20 times between cores during the, the execution of the program. Um, we provide some extra information about whether things are runnable versus being running. Um, there were particular things that if you, I have colleagues who, who, I know, who say these things are important, and I do believe it. If you have a graph showing something in green, you tend to think that's a good thing. Whereas it doesn't, they use it, so the authors of Percent use green a lot. Um, and there were places where green was just the wrong color. So we, we made some changes with that. Um, if you're looking at parallelization, you'd like to get some information perhaps about the call graph, and in particular, some dynamic information, not simply a static call graph, but to, to find out the number of times that particular functions are called within um, another function. And we've also wanted to, to make the system scalable. We realize that often with tools like this, it's great on a small demo, but what you want to do is, is apply it to something a lot bigger. Um, so we've done added two things in that, uh, two orthogonal things. Um, one is to, to present the tree of processes in a way that doesn't blow up uh, when, when, uh, when there are more processes around. Because typically, if there are a lot of child processes of a single process, they're all running similar code, often running the same code. So why not shrink that down into a single, a single node? And also, because there's a lot, we have to do a lot of analysis uh, on, the, on the trace information we gather, then why not do that in parallel? Why not, you've got a trace over, over 10 seconds, why not split that into 10 sections and pr process those in parallel? Um, so it's a data parallel uh, solution there. Okay, so let me show you where we are with percent two. What sort of information do we get? Um, we've added uh, information about the number of schedulers that are active at any one time. So this is a graph, um, the maximum number here is four, and you can see in this in this particular computation, you're pretty much you're using your schedulers for all that time, apart from this gap here. Um, one of the things that we allow is that in, in these graphs you can select a time and zoom in on that. This is this is 45 percent. Uh, this is not something we've added. Um, well, that particular we've added this this whole thing, but allowing you to zoom in and out of this this is proves to be very helpful. But you can see there, there's something going on. You're not getting full usage of all four schedulers in that particular period. So that's helpful to see. We show the tree about all the processes that are running in a way that is um, hierarchical. So we show here we have the parent processes. And if you click on the plus there, the tree for process has children, that expands and shows you the immediate children. So you're able to view that tree in a, instead of having a single list of processes, there's some structure to the, to the way the tree is shown. Um, we also, we've also added information here. You can see that this particular process, we've got the, the number of run queue changes. That PID 23 has changed 32 times. This, this one here has changed 1900 times. Um, We'll, we also gather information about the, the message passing that goes on. So the number of messages received and sent at any one process. <coughs> and we've signaled here also the average size of messages. Um, 
I mean, one of the problems I'm sure you know if you've done any tracing with airline is that you can generate a huge amount of information, an undigestible, an indigestible amount of information very quickly. So one of the things we've done under the hood is tweak the, um, the monitoring of messages, the tracing of messages, so you don't, when you trace a message, store the whole message, but you just store its, its size. So that's keeping log files, keeping trace files a lot smaller. Um, but here you can monitor, you can see the average size of messages passed, received and sent from a particular person. Um, and here you see there's an example of the run queue history. That it's moved from run queue 1 to 4 to 1 to 3 to 1 to 2. So there's been a lot of, a lot of migration of that process. Um, and you've got the message. Again, you've got this message information here. But also you've got a, a, an indication of the percentage of time that's spent waiting. That was, we've indicated that by orange rather than green. So you've got a sense that it's waiting, it's not doing anything. Um, in that, in that. The message passing stats I've talked about before. We've also here, when we have a number of processes that are similar and the same, we just, we, instead of having 66 children, we just collapse those into one. You can expand it if you wish, but um, typically you don't want to see that. It's information which is, is just getting, it's just noise. Um, so there we are. We get to see the parent-child relationships between processes, and here we've got some dynamic function information. So you see an AST loop uh, calls the function AST uh, loop there. And then this function calls the, um, it's this descendant 107 times. And then below there are 397 calls. So that's a good indication that something is going on that you might want to focus on. Okay. Um, let's skip over this. And here you get, you you're allowed, you can get to see the activity of a, a selection of processes over a particular time period. Um, and here we've got uh, green signifies that something is running, and orange signifies that it's runnable but not running. So you can see very clearly over that over that time period, and <coughs> fill it out, what is running, what is actually running, and what is is uh, potentially running. What is runnable. So that gives you. I think a very clear picture about what's what's going on. Well, a fairly clear picture. Let me talk you through an example, which I hope will clarify things. Okay, I've talked about compression already, and I've talked about parallelization. So we, we take multiple log files, which we process. You can, as you can imagine, you can process these one second sections separately, and then you have to do a bit of sewing together at the at the um, at the junction. But you can process them pretty much in parallel. Uh, apart from that, so here. So then integrate them into a single result. And here we have some, um, we've got support for distribution. What we've got here is um, information about messages sent between two particular nodes. You can see on here, it looks like somebody's thrown a um, or whatever. What we've got, you can see there are two bursts of communication between these two particular nodes. And what you're getting here is um, each dot represents a message, and the y-axis is the size of the message. So you can see you're, you're sending messages. I mean, there you're sending a whole sequence of messages of that size, whether it is 32, probably. Um, but apart from that, you've got messages of, of varying size sent between the two between the two nodes. Okay. So let's move on to the case study. Um, I guess this is. This, this refers to previous work. We built this system called Wrangler for refactoring. And one of the things that we do in Wrangler is we do clone detection. We look for similar code in projects across multiple multiple uh, file projects. And the way that uh, Wrangler works is that you you pass some file, the, the files you're interested in. You you flatten those trees into a, a, a huge string which summarizes all the information in the trees. Within that, we use a string, um, a string comparison, a very fast string comparison program written in C, in fact, to identify things that might be clones, and then we check that the, the things that we found are indeed clones. So we've got a system that allows you to, to, to detect 
clone of all the clones and only the clones. Um, you don't have any false positives. Okay, but let's take a look at what sort of... If you look at the, the existing system, or the system before we did any work on it, here is what happens on a sort of four core machine. You can see that pretty much we're getting flat performance on one core. There are peaks where you're getting a bit of two four. But basically it's, it's a sequential program. Um, so what do we want to look at? Well, we can take a look at the top level processes. And what we've done here is we've selected those processes, including their children, but not, um, not all the aggregated processes. And what we're going to do is compare their, what they're doing. And this gives us this picture of the computation as it's going on. Um, and you can see that we've got computation going on there. Um, this is the main thread. And then we have these um, <coughs> situation where these processes are runnable, um, but not, not running. And you can see really we've not got it's not much opportunity. That's why some of the noise has disappeared. Um, there's not much opportunity there for, for um, parallelization. But let's look at that critical process. This is the one that, that where all the work is going on. So let's zero in on that and see what's going on in here. Um, we can do that. We've chosen this particular section at the beginning, and then we can look to see what is active, what functions are being called inside that time period. And what you can see is that these green sections on the dark grey indicate that during that time period, this function is, um, is active for that period, and these others show, the dull green shows that it's active for the whole period and for beyond uh, the, the bright green shows. So this gives us an indication of what's going on, what's being called at that particular point. Um, and then what we can do is take a look at the a time slice within that period of what the function calls are. And here you can begin to see we've got a call there with one that's leading to seven, seven calls down there. So focusing in on that, we spot we've got a, um, a list comprehension. So it's relatively straightforward to transform that into a parallel map. So that's the first refactoring gives us that. And you can see now within that within that first phase, we've now got um, utilization up to about we've got uh, the potential for going up to about twelve parallel processes at, at most of them. But you can see we've got a lot more a lot more than we had on that flat one. <coughs> so what we do next is look again. Again look at these processes. Um, these are the ones that we're we're interested in, these are long-lived ones. So you've got the, the parallel stuff going on there. These are long-lived ones. Let's take a look at what's going on there. If we look at the call graph. You can see we've got a list for each. So again, that's spotted um, a particular a particular case that we can we can investigate. But what we do is replace that with a parallel for each. So it's not. I'm not suggesting that the refactorings we're doing here are, are rocket science. But the tool is zeroing in on the places that we can do those relatively straightforward. Um, so now we get this situation. We, we do the par parsing in parallel. Here we're doing the um, tree flattening in parallel. Doing loads of opportunities for doing that. But we still got a flat section right at the end. So let's see what's, what's happening here. This is the process that's active at that point. So let's take a look at what's going on there. Um, and if we look at the full call graph here, you can begin to see that here we've got this examine clone candidates, he's calling these things multiple times. So again, there's something going on there that, that looks like um, we should look at it. And what we get here is a, we don't have, so you can see we've had a selection of things. We had a, a list comprehension that we could parallelize, uh, for each we could parallelize. Here we've got a, a, an explicitly recursive function that we have to transform into a call to a parallel for each. So there are different things that give rise to um, that give rise to, to this sort of situation. So I think trying to do a purely static scan through your program for all instances of a, a list comprehension or a, a for each or a, 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 recursive, a function that recurses on one list, you're going to get an awful lot of false positives. Because what we're doing here, because we're looking at the dynamic information we've got, 
we're able to zoom in on precisely the case that it's of interest. So we can do that, and with any luck, that gives us this situation. Um, so we've got parallel passing, we've got parallel tree flattening, we've got uh, parallel search through potential candidates for, um, for actual clones. Um, and so what we've done in terms of that original structure is, is, is something like that. And you could argue we could have done that anyway. We've been able to use the information that we've got to direct us very clearly to where we want to go. So I think that's, that shows all the, you know, it's, it, frankly, it's not a, a, a trivial example. It's allowing us to, to take this, this amount of data, deal with it effectively, present it, and, and see it very clearly, particularly from those process traces, what's going on. Okay, what next? Oh, and here we're getting, this is the speed, the, the speed up we ultimately get. That's on a four core machine. Oh, no, sorry, that's on a 20. That's on a 4 um, Why it gets us to 4.5, we have to do something peculiar going on. Um, but, I mean, if we could get if we could push that a bit further, we'd do it very well. So, what are our next steps? Um, we're looking at the front end of percent. We'd like to change that to make it a bit more interactive. Um, so, using slightly more modern HTML5 technology. I've got a group of students who are working on that at the moment. What we want to do next is to look at doing online profiling. So getting into live information from computation, not simply this sort of um, not simply this sort of uh, post-mortem dump. Now obviously there are there are problems there if you're trying to pull information off a multi-core system live. Can you get the data off quickly enough? I think what we need to do is look at ways that we can process data on chip, perhaps using Using, using cores to process things close to the place where the data has been generated, and also looking at ways that we can um, we can stop data being generated when we don't want that data, um, and looking at how we'll extend our refactoring to this. We've got some other work on release, so there's a very nice paper on parallelizing dialyzer, um, mainly using HTOP as an indication of what was going on there. And that's a paper on that in the Erlang workshop 2012. <coughs> That's Costas Zagonas and his students. Um, they've also, they and, and people in Greece have built a very nice benchmarking suite called Bench Earl, which I'd like to recommend you. Got the graphs, the previous graphs from there. And we've we have done, and, and the, the guys in Greece have done work on extending D-trace um, facilities, and also we've done some work on extending tracing. So you can um, you can filter messages, so not all, all trace messages get, get generated. Also, this business of tracing smaller, tracing message size rather than the message itself. So, in conclusion, I've introduced the release project. I've shown you a tool that we've, we've been able to use to support um, scalable parallelization. Um, we should have a release of the, of the infrastructure itself early in 2013. And I definitely want to say thanks very much to the Percept team, who, as I say, on whose shoulders we are. We are standing. This is a, an open source project, so there's the it's on uh, GitHub. So if you'd be interested in using it or contributing, we welcome your your uh, taking part. So thank you very much. Questions.
But I think what we need to do, we need to think about, we need to look at, at running it on larger systems and see how far, how much information we have to filter at an earlier stage. I mean, the way that it works at the moment is that, and this is a good thing, you say, I just want to take my, my system as it is, collect all the information you can, and then I will, I will search through and find the information I want. Now that's fine, but if there are things you know that you want, it might be better to trace those things up front. So we need to think about that and the way in which we can, we can do that interaction. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, there, this complements, you could just use D-Trace, or you could use Erlang system tracing if you know precisely what it is. So this gives you an overall picture of something. Um, and I, I, my, my feeling is that no tool is ever going to be perfect, so we're going to use a combination of tools. But certainly we're, we're thinking about ways that we might, we might tune it to allow you to, to, um, to trace different things, trace a subset of things. Okay. Yeah. Things that you're accelerating with parallelization are inherently single threaded apps anyway. Uh, you know, a dialyzer and stuff is sort of pretty much one sequential process. Mm -hmm. But you know, the traditional Erlang app is very, very um, multi, you know, very, very parallel as it is. Mm -hmm. So adding even more parallelization will probably slow it down. So imagine if you do like Rui app, you know, which has thousands of process, or you get a D or something like that, and then added even more parallelization on top. As there's already way more process than the number of cores, I imagine the overhead of all the parallelization actually reduces through that. So is that what you find on I brain? think it just depends yeah. on the application. So it, is it quite a tool that's very much geared to sort of taking more traditional single-threaded applications and sort of pulling more parallels out of that? Rather? I mean, I don't... I don't think so, particularly. I mean, I, I, I can't think that... that um, well, certainly what we've done has been, has been particularly looking at <coughs> It's more seeing, what, seeing what's going on, just getting an overview of what's happening. I mean, I think what, what it can certainly do, and I guess this is um, you know, thinking about, about next steps, again, this question of there are perhaps particular periods. If you, 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 you take an overview of the system at a particular point in the computation, right, or in the, the evolution of the system, where it looks as though it's running sequentially, right? you can, you can you provide some, some well. parallelization in that area. You know, when you hit Amdahl's there's yes. That's the thing that's, that's always going to be there. Um, so you need to think about that. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that there you collect a metric of uh, process migration between the uh, CGLF, right? Yeah. So, okay, we have a number. What can we do with that? So, you see that there is a process that migrates a lot. So, what? That's a very good question. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think what you know is that there is something. I mean, I guess that's... Did you the oh, right, sorry, I'm sorry. The question was, you can see that a process migrates a lot, so what, what can you do about it? Um, but I guess in a way that's perhaps a symptom of something of being something problematic in the, in the, um, in the way that your, your information is, is shared between schedules. Because in principle, if your, if your system was, was self-regulating, you would think that you wouldn't have to move things around. You create processes, of course, they would spread out through work stealing. But then each each um, scheduler would, de would deal with its own work. So it's so, a number proportional to the uh, number of cores not used. So that's a very interesting, we should look at that. That's a really interesting question. But certainly, it, as far as I understand it, and I think this is probably the right answer, the OT team don't want to let us do things like nailing processes to, sure. you know, they're not, because they think that that's, that might work in a particular situation, but in, in general it's going to be, it's going to be not. Um, but I think it's a symptom, I mean, it's a bad smell, if you like. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm not sure I would want to say anything definitive. But that's a good point, I mean, that's perhaps what we should do is do some research. It might be more definitive. Yeah, so thank you. So probably you could have seen that in the, uh, after you started modifying uh, the code to parallel, parallelized versions, you probably could have seen 
that those numbers in the room. We should have that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's always good to have it. To leave us, having given the talk, leaving with a question that we have to follow. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.